This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, another conversation with Bill Shelley. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek, and today I have the pleasure of talking with Bill Shelley. His memoir, Sense of Wonder, My Life in Comic Fandom, The Whole Story, was recently released through North Atlantic Books. And I have a great time talking with Bill about his fascinating history with fandom and its links to his identity. But before we get to that conversation, I want to tell all of you that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the fine folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off at the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off at the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price, sometimes 50% off cover, but every now and again you can find discounts that go higher than that. And if you go to DCB Service right now, you'll find incredible savings on a variety of titles, including many of Bill Shelley's books. For instance, you can find his biography of Joe Kubert, Man of Rock, at 30% off of the cover price. You can also get his Art of Joe Kubert at 35% off cover, and the same with his more recent biography of John Stanley, which you can find at 35% off. You can also get his American Comic Book Chronicles, the 1950s, which we actually discuss in our conversation, at 25% off of the cover price. There's no doubt that you just can't beat the prices at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com for all of your comics pre-ordering needs, and after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. There's perhaps no better historian on American comics fandom than Bill Shelley. Having been a part of the scene scene in the 1960s and early 1970s, and starting when he was a teenager, Shelley worked with many of the movers and shakers within the fan community and published several fanzines of his own. In the early 1990s, he returned to comics as a chronicler and as a historian, writing various overviews of comic fandom, and then later making his mark as a comics biographer, covering the lives of such creators as Joe Kubert, Otto Bender, John Stanley, and Harvey Kurtzman, the latter biography earning him a 2016 Eisner Award for Best Comics-Related Book. On this interview episode, I talk with Bill about his new book, Sense of Wonder, and his decisions to revise and expand his memoir from its original 2001 version released through Tomorrow's Publishing. This new edition of Sense of Wonder, published by North Atlantic Books, is significantly expanded, covers Shelley's entire life up until now, and is written with a much more personal and revealing tone than the original. We talk a lot about his history in comics fandom and his growth as an editor and writer. This is really an insightful and heartening conversation, so let's listen to that now. I'm pleased to have back on the Comics Alternative, Bill Shelley. He has a new book out, Sense of Wonder, My Life in Comic Fandom, The Whole Story, which came out last month from North Atlantic Books. Bill, welcome back on the show. Oh, hi, Derek. It's good to be back. Yeah, we had you on a couple of years ago when your Otto Bender book had just recently come out. Right, that was when I had... um rewritten the book that uh, I'd done it back around uh, 2000, year 2000, and I found so much material that had come up that uh, I ended up doing a new edition, which was quite successful. And actually, that book was my first with North Atlantic Books, who asked me what else I had after that came out, 
and I um, pitched them the idea for this new version of Sense of Wonder. You know, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think that's a really nice way into this recent book because you're doing something somewhat similar to your Bender book with Sense of Wonder because Sense of Wonder was originally published, was it 2001 by Tomorrow's? That's correct. Um, There's a big distinction, however. Mm -hmm. The Bender book was what I would call a revised and corrected and somewhat extended version so this sense of wonder that's come out now is really two books in one. It's the original book for the first half, heavily revised with additional material added to deepen the story, and then it has an entirely new second half, which I call part two, which takes the story where the earlier one left off all the way to the present day. So... That's why I call it the whole story. But I, it's important for people to know that if they have the original book, they not only have only half of this new book, but they're getting two books in one, really, so it will all be under one cover, and the first half is heavily revised. Now, doesn't the first half of this new book, or what was originally your first sense of wonder, didn't that end around, let's say, the mid-70s? That's right. It ended right after I'd been uh, rejected by DC Comics uh, (laughs) for their new talent program in 1973 and uh, uh, was about to um, move from Idaho to Seattle and uh, find my destiny, so to speak, in uh, the Emerald City. And that's how it ended with me on the road uh, in my car. Okay. So for those who may be familiar with the original 2001 Sense of Wonder, what are some of the other differences between that earlier work and this new book, which you describe as, in essence, two books in one? I mean, you say you made some revisions, some changes, you included some material, even in the first half uh, that had been the original 2001 book. Well, the main thing that's new Um, is tied up with the whole purpose of doing this uh, expanded edition. And that is that I wanted to talk about what it was like growing up as a comics fan and a member of fandom, but also as a gay comics fan who was gradually realizing the fact, as I was a teenager, and how that affected my point of view as a reader of comics, and in general, how it affected my life. And the reason I felt I had to do that was not because I wanted to share, you know, details about my sex life or anything, but because I ended up having children later in life, and that was a key part of my story. So for me to explain how I had children, I'd have to say, well, who did I have children with? (laughs) So it ended up, I ended up realizing I couldn't tell that story without being frank about that side of my life, which is certainly not shocking in this day and age. Mm -mm. Um, What were some of the differences between the time that you were writing the earlier Tomorrow's version, uh, I mean, from from your perspective, in terms of your comfort level at sharing um, very personal information like that, and and then now? Right. Well, I think um, the main thing that changed is that I retired. I'd been a federal employee for... uh, like 25 years. And in the workplace, there weren't protections against job discrimination if you were gay. And I actually was working uh, with some people that weren't very uh, homo-friendly, so to speak. So therefore, I felt like coming out to the world was not really the wisest thing to do. Although, of course, my family, my friends, many members of fandom knew that I was gay. I felt like putting it in a book and publishing it was maybe a little further than I wanted to go at that time. Well, since then, I have retired, and I am certainly um, not ashamed of, of being gay at all. I have no problem coming out to the world, so I felt free to do so. And, you know, one of the things that you do in this new sense of wonder is, I mean, obviously, your um sexuality your being gay comes out quite prominently in the second part right you know the new material but you make it seem seamless by interweaving these aspects this part of your life into that earlier story what in the new book is 
part one, uh, which had been the 2001 text, to where if someone is completely unfamiliar with that earlier Tomorrow's book, um, they would think that this is just one cohesive narrative that you sat down to write uh, just recently. Well, that was the idea, of course. Um, and also, you know, this was just, it's like uh, your sexuality is just an aspect of your life. It's, it, and therefore, by uh, adding it at certain points, it, it deepens the story, and it allows me to talk in a little more honest way about my life in general. But, but at the other, on the other hand, it's still essentially the story of a young boy who had a creative desire to create, who had a, a cr- strong creative impulse, and found a way to express that in comic fandom as a fanzine publisher in the 60s and 70s, and how that fandom eventually ended up giving me the writing career that I wanted as an older man, and that I hadn't achieved in any other way. I ended up... Uh, um, a very frustrated writer till I came back to Phantom in 1990, but that's in part two. So it's still the story. It's really still the story of of me and my creative desires and uh, impulses. Uh, it doesn't heavily veer into the gay side to the point where um, it doesn't seem appropriate, or it seems like it's a real. Um, uh, it's too much. I don't think it's too much. Mm-mm. And. You know, we should mention that your exploration of comics fandom is definitely not limited to Sense of Wonder. I mean, you've become quite an authority on the history of fandom. I mean, your your other books, uh, The Golden Age of Comic Fandom, Founders of Comic Fandom, and then Fandom's Finest Comics, you've done a lot of research. And as you mentioned, when you came back to fandom in, what, 1990, 1991, to research The Golden Age of Comic Fandom— I mean, you reacquainted yourself with this phenomena in a way that gave you, I think, a different perspective, it would seem to me, from having grown up in that culture. So I guess what, I, what I'd like to do is to have you talk a bit about fandom, because some of perhaps our younger listeners may find this a little unusual because the communication dynamics today are so vastly different from when they were in the early 1960s. Certainly. um, To explain comic fandom is really to say that it was kind of like the internet, uh, but at a time when you had to communicate through the U.S. mail. So instead of being able to send an email that arrives instantly, you would write a letter, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, drop it in the mail, and the person would get it in three or four days. (laughs) So it was a very different um, uh, speed and uh, uh, tempo to the communication. But it was still similar in the sense that you were communicating with people who you weren't part of your immediate world, and you were uh, you could be 13 or 14, and you could be writing letters to people in England, or you could be uh, communicating with people all over the United States, which I did back then. Um, and, and it was a way that, at that time, comics um, were highly disrespected, even more than they are today. So I think they are still looked down upon to some degree or other. But back then, um, comics were considered strictly for kids because the comics code had come in to clean up comics in the 50s. So comics had been dumbed down essentially for for children. And in the 60s, they started to come back into their own with the rise of Marvel. And suddenly, you know, there were comics that were of interest to teenagers. And at that point, they you know, you want to communicate, you want to share your enthusiasm, but who could you share it with? There weren't, it wasn't, a, comics were not a mainstream thing at that time. Everybody didn't buy comics. At that time, they'd become more marginalized. Um, and therefore, in order to uh, share your hobby, you had to really communicate with people in other towns and other cities, and comic fandom came along to uh, provide an environment for that kind of communication. Well, you know, you you were there uh, from from the very beginning of the this kind of organized uh, comics fandom as, as it was coalescing. So, I mean, how would you describe fandom and in 
I guess, certain ways, how might it be different from the way that people may describe fandom today? Well, first of all, I would say that comic fans at that time were fans of the stories, and they were not interested in investing in comics. They weren't invested, interested in the value of comics. And even the selling of back issues was really a, a, a fairly small part of it in many ways. It was really about enthusiasts that loved comics. And there was no money culture around it. The fanzines that were produced, the amateur magazines that were produced, and there were something like 4,000 of them, individual issues produced between 1960 and 1975, um, were all done without uh, you know, uh, paying any of the contributors any money to do uh, work for them. They were uh, sold for simply the cost of what it cost to print and mail them. Uh, no one was making any profit or trying to make a living on them. So it was a very pure um, time for the appreciation of the form. And I think that's one of the key differences because nowadays, of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. And and everybody is interested in the the uh, the value of old comics or how much the latest Avengers movie has grossed. And a lot of the talk is about financial the financial side of comics. Uh, this was about what was on the page, the um, imaginations of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby at Marvel and uh, the wonderful artwork at, at DC and the stories and so on. And that was the main thing. And also researching the history of comics, because no one had ever even figured out what had been published when comics started in the late 30s and early 40s. So there was a huge effort to just make lists of what was out there, what had been published, what was collectible at that time. So um, that was uh, uh, the the feeling of fandom was about uh, discovering the hobby and appreciating it. And the way it was largely done, if you lived in a large town, you might get together with other people um, uh, in a small gathering and enjoy it. Or you would correspond with others through the mail or you would um, uh, read fan magazines that published articles um, and your letter might be published in them, and you might do drawings for them if you're an aspiring artist. And that was the the real culture at the time. Mm. Yes, and you mentioned that in addition to writing about their appreciation of the comics form, uh, Golden Age comics, current stuff at the time and otherwise, that people would also do their own comics, which, as you point out in your new book, you did quite a bit of. Uh, I mean, you wanted to be a comics artist. And so not only for your own fan magazines that you published, which I want to talk about because you you did a lot, uh, but you also submitted your work to other zines. Well, that's right. Um, when I started in comic fandom, I was only 13. This was uh, in the early 60s. So my ability was, I was a juvenile artist. I wasn't very good. So naturally, um, the only people that would publish me at that point were my, was myself. <laughs> so that's why I started publishing a fanzine, so I could put my art, such as it was, into them. But then I got better, and other fan editors began asking for illustrations or uh, perhaps a comic strip that I would draw. And I ended up, you know, contributing to quite a few fan fanzines other than my own. And it was uh, a time, which I would call kind of the origins of the comic small press, which eventually uh, there were many tributaries. There were the um, undergrounds, there was the uh, comic fandom small press, and these things uh, developed and grew until we had, you know, what we would call today alternative comics. Hmm. Now, you also point out in this book, and you also make this clear in your Auto Bender biography as well, that the relationship between comics fandom and science fiction fandom were very close, that one in many ways informed the other in making comics fandom as, uh, as as prominent as it eventually became? Well, you know, I wouldn't say that there was a, a super closeness there. 
what I would say is that comic fandom picked up the terminology and they, they, the words fanzine and, um, uh, those kind of expressions, like, uh, one of the expressions back then was something that was fanish and fanish were things that were of interest only to fans or, you know, there's all the, the, uh, terminology and so forth. They also had something called amateur press alliances, which were uh, like uh, a collection of two or three page fanzines by people that were sent to a central mailer assembled. And then each person who contributed got a copy of the whole thing. Well, that came out of science fiction fandom. So there were many different things. And also science fiction fandom had conventions. And one of the first things that uh, fans wanted to do in the sixties was figure out ways to perhaps have a convention. So we picked up on those things, but science fiction fans are a very different type. Um, And anybody who was involved in science fiction fandom back then knows that they could be uh, kind of snobbish. They could be argumentative and they were many, many famous feuds and things like that. And people seem to get off on that kind of thing in science fiction fandom in a way. Um, Comic fans never feuded. We were just happy to discover each other. We were so happy there were other people who loved what we loved. And um, and there just wasn't that kind of thing at all. So we did pick up some of the forms, but we went off in our own way. And a lot of science fiction fans, of course, had no interest whatsoever in comics, so they never got involved in comic fandom. There were some, uh, uh, primarily uh, Don and Maggie Thompson, who published a fanzine called Comic Art in the early 60s which um, they had come out of science fiction fandom. And then, of course, they went on to edit Comic Buyer's Guide in the uh, uh, late 70s and early 80s up to, you know, for like a couple of decades. So they came from science fiction fandom, but there really weren't that many. Uh, It was mostly a distinct phenomenon. Mm. One of the things that fascinated me about Sense of Wonder, and especially in the first half, is, I guess, the learning curve that you go through. And in fact, you even write about it in a comedic way, the kind of mistakes that you would make, uh, the things that you learned along the way, your ill luck at times in terms of the printing process. And I'm wondering if you can speak to your experiences as a young writer editor for these fanzines and your frustrations and the valuable lessons that you learned along the way in up until you get, I guess, into the early seventies where, as you say in your book, you're starting to create issues of sense of wonder that you're very proud of. Right. Um, I uh, definitely um, had a huge learning curve. And the thing about publishing a fanzine, if you think about it, it's an enterprise. It involves uh, organization. It involves keeping records. It involves eliciting help and contributions. It involves advertising, printing, uh, mailing, and all the different things that would be involved with a magazine. So, um, I had a lot of things to learn about getting all those things together, and I think it held me in good stead later in life because I'd learned how to um, edit a magazine and publish a magazine. Um, and maybe I didn't do those specific things later, but I used uh, some of that organizational skill. But the main thing that I always had problems with, Derek, was the printing, which you alluded to. Um, you know, these fan magazines had to be printed and they were, um, uh, for a kid, you couldn't afford expensive professional printing. Um, what you did was you use these, um, lesser methods of printing that were used like in schools and churches, um, that were, uh, called Mimeo or Ditto. And these processes were something that you could do at your, at your home. You can draw on those um, Mimeo stencils, you can type on them, then you take them off and you put them on a a machine that has a drum and you roll off copies one by one with a crank situation. And, you know, the 
so the quality of the printing was very iffy a lot of the times. It would depend on how good you were with using uh, the uh, mimeograph stencil, or if you were using ditto, using what they call ditto masters, where you would draw on those. It involved skill, and it, and it involved ex, uh, learning from uh, experience, learning by trying and uh, uh, gradually getting better at it. But it seemed like every time I'd get good at one thing, I would uh, fail at something else because we didn't have enough money to buy a mimeograph machine or a ditto machine. Uh, my, my, I grew up in a white-collar family, but we were kind of the low end of the white-collar, let's say. So my parents couldn't, a ditto machine could cost uh, 80, 80 to to $100. And back then, that was a lot of money. So I had to find places where I could print my latest issue, whether it was one of them was printed at a church, uh, one was printed at my dad's office, one was printed by my co-editor's father on his office machine. And so I was relying on the kindness of strangers, and, and each time the machine was a little different, so I couldn't get very good continuity of understanding on how to get the best results. And so I just did one thing after another, and it was just so embarrassing. Like there would be show through from, if I printed on both sides of the page, the, the page on the back would show through on the front. Or I tried drawing on a mimeograph stencil, and it looked like chicken scratch when it was printed. <laughs> I mean, it looked terrible. And I, I include examples of that in my book. You know, since this book, Sense of Wonder, has something like 200 illustrations and photographs in it. So it has lots of visual examples and material and photos. And I include some of that because, you know, it just uh, is just pathetic. <laughs> or one time I printed a cover by uh, primitive um, photocopying, which they uh, used to call Xeroxing. And those machines couldn't, uh, couldn't print a solid black area. So if you had a solid black area, it would just come out gray and terrible gray. And so, you know, uh, it just, it just, there was all these pitfalls and it was really something that I actually had the determination to keep going and going until I finally did get it right. Um, by the time I was about 16, I finally w had figured it out, but those three years before then was really something. So, when I got to that point, I just said, okay, now I'm going to start my fanzine that's going to be good. And I started uh, my fanzine called Sense of Wonder. And that's the point where I was proud of what I was doing. And, of course, I've carried that Sense of Wonder theme over into this book. You know, mentioning your mishaps with the printing process, one of the most notable, I guess, heartbreaks in the text is fairly early on, and I guess this is with your uh, zine at the time, Superheroes Anonymous, issue number two, where you had uh, original art that both Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko had sent you, and you decided to use those images as well as your own illustrations in that issue of Superhero Anonymous. And you, as you as you put it, you ran this through your uh, father's office mimeograph machine. And the result was uh, not something that was very uplifting. And these are some of the examples uh, that uh, the aforementioned examples that you include of mishaps. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine, though? Here I was, 13, and getting an original Captain America drawing, a beautiful drawing, by Jack Kirby in the mail just because I wrote him a fan letter. And the same thing happened with Steve Ditko. I got a beautiful Doctor Strange drawing. Uh, that was a, it was uh, uh, just you know I had no idea he would ever do that. And, and I received these drawings and I thought, oh my God, this is just fantastic. But by the time they came out in the fanzine with me tracing them onto the stencil, um, they just again look like chicken scratch. However, in the book, at least I I still have the Jack Kirby drawing. And I reproduced his original drawing, and you can see how nice it is. Mm -hmm. But then you can see the the printed copy, which is just there. Uh, now, I I was also quite interested in your, I guess, up and down relationship with uh, Steve Ditko as a comics fan and as someone who puts out a zine. Uh, tell us a little bit about 
your experiences with Ditgo, uh, in- including the various mishaps? Well, sure. Um, the thing is, you know, as an editor, I had no idea um, what the various ethical uh, uh, um, things I should know were. In other words, um, someone would write me a letter and I would just publish it. Or um, if someone sent me a drawing, I would publish it. And I didn't really think in terms of asking for permission or uh, that sort of thing. So when I got the um, uh, Ditko Doctor Strange drawing, you know, I included it proudly in my fan magazine. And then um, I sent him a copy when it was printed, and he wrote back. Just he was just uh, really pissed off at me <laughs> for using it. I mean, he sent it. He said, "I sent it to you because I wanted you to have a drawing. I didn't give you permission to publish it." Uh, you know, um, you, and you didn't even have the courtesy to ask. And, uh, he went kind of on and on for quite a while in this letter. Um, and I figured, well, that's it. I burned my bridges with him. Well, a little bit later on when I was older, I found out that he was doing drawings of Mr. A, uh, for fanzines because he was trying to publicize his new character, that he created, and it had first appeared in Wally Wood's um, magazine, Wit's End, and he was, uh, Ditko was trying to promote the character for something, I I don't know exactly what, and so he uh, sent me a cover for Sense of Wonder of Mr. A, and it was beautiful, it was inked, it was a pencil and ink, and in this case, I did use professional photo offset printing because obviously I, I knew then that you couldn't trace over some professional's work without losing 80% of the beauty of it. So I did that. But, you know, the covers of every issue of Sense of Wonder were um, a different color because all I, I couldn't afford full color printing. So I had to have one, co- one cover would be printed on white paper. One cover would be printed on goldenrod paper. One cover would be printed on light blue paper. And that way it created a variety issue to issue. So when his came along, the only color that the printer had that I hadn't used was pink. <laughs> and so <laughs> I had the cover printed on pink and I don't know, uh, you know, exactly, uh, whether anybody remembers this, but if you were a commie back then, you were called a pinko. Yeah. And um, not only that, but the point, the main point is when he got it, Dicka was horrified because the whole concept of Mr. A is, you know, you're either good or you're bad. There's no gray area in between. So, you know, the idea of printing on colored paper when he, you know, envisioned it as a black and white concept was just, uh, a, a, in his mind, was a huge misstep. And it was just another slap in the face. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it didn't seem like I could do anything right by Steve Ditko. But you eventually had a positive experience, though, with Ditko. Yeah, well, I did. And I've had more than even some that aren't in the book. But, yes, uh, later um, I was... Uh, uh, talking on the phone with another fanzine editor who said, you know, um, we're kind of stopping our fanzine and we have this, uh, Steve Ditko says he has this Mr. A strip, which is six pages long, or maybe it was eight pages. Uh, and we're wondering if you would be interested now that you're printing sense of wonder all the way through with professional printing, no longer the cheap methods, uh, if you would be interested in publishing it there, because we can't use it. And I just had good timing, because I happened to be talking with him on the phone at just the right time. And I said, oh my God, yes, yes, I have a new issue coming out, and I'll just change the contents and run it right up front. And he said, okay, but here's the thing. Ditko won't send you the artwork, because he's had problems with fans taking his original art and not returning it, which he always asked for. So he'll send it directly to the printer. You'll tell him where the printer is, and he'll send the artwork there. And that's how it has to work. I said, fine, that's great. And so finally, I guess because I didn't have any finger in the pie, <laughs> uh, it came out great. <laughs> and uh, I, I did get a nice letter from, from Steve, um, seemingly forgetting our earlier uh, little uh, dust-ups. <laughs> he, you know, he, he didn't bring up the past. He just said he thought it was very good and he was glad it was there. And actually, of course, 
having it meant I could sell a lot of copies of my fanzine, which was handy because that kind of printing was expensive. So Ditko really helped me get sense of wonder up to uh, a more impressive format, even though that wasn't his intention. Now, when you were first starting off, you had several zine projects, or at least projects that had different names. I mean, you would change the name of your your zine as you went along. Uh, You eventually settled on Sense of Wonder that really became, I guess, your mark on comics fandom. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the evolution of Sense of Wonder. You mean the concept? Yeah, I mean, how you came up with this as maybe distinct from some of your earlier attempts at a zine and how you felt that, because at one point you left Sense of Wonder, but then you brought it back. And so what was it about that, not only that caused you to start it as you did, but brought you back to it? What was the draw? Well, you know, I have to explain my creative process a little bit here. Just briefly, it's that, um, generally, um, ideas come when I'm just sort of thinking and thinking around a subject and then ideas kind of float up in my brain and come to me and I don't know really where they come from, but that's how I get ideas. And I was in, you know, uh, in 1960. Seven. I was casting around for late 66, early 67. I was casting around for an idea for a fanzine. And this just came up. Sense of Wonder just came up. And this, of course, Sense of Wonder, I wanted this fanzine, I wanted to be my ultimate fanzine. And so I had seen the, the expression. I know I was aware of it. Why it came up to my mind at that point, I, you know, it's a mystery because it, it turned out to be extremely meaningful to me because obviously the sense of wonder is what attracted me to comics. When I first saw my first comic book, it excited what you would call a sense of wonder, uh, um, just a feeling, a wonderful feeling of the, of an imaginative experience. But why it occurred to me at that point, I couldn't explain, but it's become the, it really has become the theme of the book because recapturing that sense of wonder later in life is kind of what um, brought my life together. Now, where the first, I guess, tomorrow's edition of Sense of Wonder ends, again, it's around the earlier, mid-1970s. And at this point, I guess you're heading out, um, or I, I, I well, actually, you had, um, I guess, a series of mishaps. Uh, one was a big fire that seemed to have been devastating, where you lost a lot of your work. Uh, but but you also had high hopes and then dashed expectations with DC Comics. And it was at that point that you, at least for a while, left Comicsdom, correct? That's right. Um what happened uh, it was exactly what you said. Um, I had a, a horrible apartment fire when I was in college, and I lost my entire portfolio of artwork, except for a few drawings that were at my parents' house, and all my paintings. I did quite a bit of oil painting when I was in college. Not very good, but I had them there. But um, basically, a lot of my uh, fanzines, again, my comics were home, so I didn't lose my comics, but I lost my artwork. And that really was a kick in the gut, because at that point, I was finishing college and getting ready to go out in the world, and what was in my portfolio would be my calling card. Um, So I had given up, but then DC came up with this new talent program uh, thing where they said that we're going to interview people and we're going to hire six young apprentices. And I went, oh, well, maybe maybe I will just do some sample pages, and I'll go back to that New York Comic Con and see if DC would be interested in hiring me. So that's what I did. And when they rejected me, and I was rejected by none other than a, uh, the stellar, talented person named Vince Coletta, um, I was... I felt like, well, I I guess I don't have a future in comics, at least not right now, and I have to figure out what I'm going to do to support myself. And when I had to 
really face that for the first time after college, it became a big thing. And I it was, you know, I had to get a, a job, I had to get an apartment, I had to figure out how to function on my own. And comics were a little too uh, expensive. Fandom was a little too expensive, and I didn't have that kind of additional income. But more than that, I had, I had kind of felt like fandom had kind of, uh, I had some um, uh, resentment toward DC, and I had some um, feelings of um, uh, loss over the stuff I'd lost in the fire. So I really left comic fandom, which seems strange now to look back, but I left it in 1974, and I just did other things. Like, what does a young man do when he's single in the big city? Well, he he tries to get laid. He he, <laughs> he parties. He does all kinds of things. And 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 at the same time, though, I did still want to. Uh, I did still want to write. I had a creative impulse, so I tried to work on different things that were not comics related. But I was away from comic fandom until 1990. And then what brought you back? Well, Batman brought me back. Uh, that's the title of the chapter, anyway. Mm -hmm. What happened was, the Batman movie came out. And I was in my office at the SBA, uh, and um, I looked outside, and Batman walked by. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> and I, I realized, oh, it's Halloween. People are in costumes. I mean, some people would dress up in a costume on Halloween. I don't know if they still do that, but they did that in 1990. And this, I went out and, you know, I started joking around with the guy. And I said, well, you know, I used to collect comics. He goes, oh, I still do. And I said, you do? I said, is there still comic fandom? And he said, oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm a member of a comics uh, amateur press alliance. And uh, blah, blah, blah. And I went, wow. You know, I kind of, you know, it kind of occurs to me that it might be nice to get back in touch with some of the people that I used to know. At that point, I was open to it again. Maybe there was enough water under the bridge. And also, I was doing better in life, and I was established. At that point, I was probably 39, uh, I think 40. And he uh, got me the addresses of some people I used to know in fandom, and one of them was, was named Jeff Gelb. And Jeff and I had collaborated on some comic strips way back when, back when we were uh, teenagers. So I got in touch with him, and through Jeff, he uh, brought me back into fandom and, and told me exactly about what was happening with the San Diego Comic-Con and uh, about comic, all the things that were happening in comics in general. Now, I had been aware of comic stores and so on, because I actually was involved in a comic store shortly before that, but I hadn't gotten back into fandom at that time. I didn't see that as something I wanted to do. But now I began to uh, think, well, this could be great, you know, I mean, just be for fun. And I got back in it, and then I started realizing that no one remembered the old fanzines anymore. Nobody seemed to remember the people that I knew that were, you know, sort of my little demigods back in the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, people like Jerry Bales, Ron Foss, Gordon Love, um, Bill Joe White, uh, Howard Rogowski, people like that. And so I realized that there was no one place to uh, get the history of it, and I started writing little histories and publishing them, uh, and getting them published in a fanzine that was still going. And gradually that led into my research and actually my obsession with researching the history of comic fandom, which I had been a part of. Mm. Yeah, I you, you mentioned your brief and ill-fated, I guess, uh, experience with a comic shop. Uh, didn't turn out that well. You You devote part of a chapter to that as well. Well, yeah, that was a, a that was a mistake because I happened to be working with a, for, um, a guy whose son was into comics and wanted to start a comic store, so he, uh, I got involved in that as maybe doing being a partner in it in it, and it was just let's say it was just ill fated, but it's a kind of a funny story in the book, and I do explain it in some depth. But basically, my partner was a pathological liar and so on. He's no longer alive, so I can say that. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I'm hurt without fear of being accused of uh, uh, 
slandering anybody, but of course, the best defense against uh, slander is the truth. Uh, and, you know, he was unreliable as a partner, and we ended up lasting only six months, but it was quite a, a roller coaster ride. Hmm. Now, your initial books on comics fandom, um, you write that you were having trouble in finding a publisher, and so you just decided to publish in publish them yourselves yourself under your i guess the name of the press was hamster press that's correct yes and uh i mean this is in the book but uh, share with our listeners how you came up with the name hamster press (laughs) well i had pet hamsters when i was a kid and when i was starting up my my uh self-publishing in the 1990s i thought well what am i going to call myself you know and, and a lot of these companies were you know like uh, you know, dynamic this or worldwide that or international. They tried to sound big. And I thought, I don't want to do that. In fact, I want to s- make it a joke on it. So I called it Hamster Press. And uh, and uh, I had actually used Hamster Press a little bit back in the old fanzine days as my so-called, you know, umbrella publishing company. So it was really bringing forward the idea. But it was kind of a cute idea, and I think it was unique, and it actually uh, people seem to like it. Yeah, and in your first two books on fandom, The Golden Age, and then Fandom's Finest Comics were published through Hamster Press. But you did get uh, McFarlane to publish that third book, Founders of Comic Fandom, which is a series of profiles, right? That's right. Um, I did about 10 books through Hamster Press, actually. Um, various collections of material from the old fanzines um, and uh, starting with the golden age of comic fandom which was the actual history which is still my one of my best known books the others are sort of like subsets of it um, but at a certain point um, self-publishing was just too much working on the books and then trying to do all the things involved with self-publishing was just too much work for me as a, a single person and I uh, had gotten to the point where finally, you know, I had a somewhat of a following. And so uh, publishers began to get interested, um, in, you know, here and there in what I was doing. One of the things was uh, Founders of Comic Fandom with McFarlane. But earlier than that, what, one of the things was the first um, edition of Sense of Wonder, which was published by Tomorrow's Publishing, um, sort of a spinoff of my columns in Alter Ego magazine. Mm -hmm. And you're still an associate editor at Alter Ego? That's right. And we just passed issue 151, uh, 152. And boy, I'll tell you, when we started that back in 1998, I mean, I was there at the table with Roy Thomas and and, uh, John Morrow. And um, we never dreamed, I never dreamed, in a million years that there would be over 150 issues and I'd be doing this 20 years later. But indeed, I am. And um, I don't know how much longer can go on, but Roy tells me it's <laughs> healthy. So I guess as long as Roy is healthy and has the, 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 uh, the desire, which he seems to, um, it'll continue. Hmm. Well, congratulations on that. Well, you know, I've contributed to something like two-thirds of the issues, not every issue. But I've also been a resource, and I've contributed other things to the magazines, helping Roy and some of the others. You know, another thing that comes out in, clearly in the second part of your book is, I guess, maybe a good way of putting it is that you kind of found your calling, so to speak, uh, when you began working on biographies. Now, you, you had one, I think, early on, on Harry Langdon, uh, a comedic film actor. Right. But, I mean, since then, you've largely defined yourself, at least to, to many in the reading public, with uh, or by biographies of great figures in comics. I mean, you had your 2008 book on Joe Kubert, Man of Rock, and then your Eisner Award winning book on Harvey Kurtzman. And then since then, we have, you know, the book that you and I last spoke about, uh, the Otto Bender book, one on John Stanley. And then you have another one coming out later this year, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, 
the biography form does seem to suit me. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but um, I'm comfortable with it. The book coming out uh, at the end of this year is about uh, James Warren. Mm -hmm. It's called James Warren, Empire of Monsters. And it will be published by Fantagraphics Books. And I finished work on it, and they're in the process of editing it and uh, designing it right now. Hmm. Well, maybe I don't want you to give anything away that you shouldn't give away, but let's talk a little bit about this upcoming book, uh, James Warren, Empire of Monsters. Uh, Where does this interest of Warren publications come from and what led eventually to the writing of that book? Well, uh, I had interviewed Jim Warren uh, about his experience working with Harvey Kurtzman when I was doing the Kurtzman biography Mm -hmm. and we'd had a wonderful conversation and, uh, he was very, very nice, uh, very cordial, although with his hearing issues, it was hard for him to talk on the phone, but he, we did it. And I, he, he, you know, he loved the Kurtzman book and so on. But my interest in Warren really comes from the fact that I used to buy creepy and eerie off the stands back in the sixties. And I really liked the fact that they were the artwork was in black and white, and that it was bigger than a regular comic book, so you could really see it. The printing was better quality, even if it was only black and white. And the stories were not controlled by the comics code, so you could have stories that were, let's just say, a little edgier. I mean, this was horror; these were horror comics, um, and so it would be edgier than anything you could get from DC and, or Marvel. And He was using the best artists in the business, you know, people like Al Williamson, Wally Wood, uh, and so on. I mean, you know, everybody, uh, a lot of them were former EC artists, Reed Crandall, um, and others that were just uh, really superb at what they did. And so um, he, he was providing an alternative to mainstream comics for the readers as they got perhaps a little older. Um. I'm not saying these were things that were produced for adults exactly, but they were an alternative to mainstream comics that kind of helped bridge the gap until there were comics for adults. And so I think he occupies a very interesting niche in the history of comics from, you know, doing those magazines uh, starting in 1965 through 1982 or thereabouts Um, that was um, unique. And of course, Marvel liked what he did enough to do a whole line of black and white books that were more or less imitations of what Jim Warren was doing in the Marvel manner. Uh, So, um, you know, I think he's a very worthy subject and an interesting man, an unorthodox individual. uh, you, You know, he's an original person. Now, some people hate him, some people love him, but that's part of what makes him interesting. Mm. And appropriately enough, this book is scheduled to be released right before Halloween of this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I uh, we'll see what exactly when it comes out. It, it, these, these publication dates have to be set, right. but um, we'll see, you know, exactly. It may be um, before, maybe before Halloween, maybe slightly after, but yeah. That's the goal. That's, I think, uh, October 30th, I think, is the official publication date. That's what I see on so, Amazon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's what we're aiming at, and it'll be around then for sure. Okay. Now, I, I'm curious how you choose your biographical subjects, because as I mentioned, you got quite a spread here. John Stanley, Otto Bender, Kurtzman, Kubert. Um, how do you decide, I'm going to write about this person? Well... In order to write a good biography, you have to have bring something new to the table. You can't just take everything that's been printed about them, put it together, and republish it, and it be very good, in my opinion. I'm not saying that it might not be worthwhile on some level, but for me to want to spend the two years it takes, a year to two years it takes to write these things on a subject, I want it to be... Um, bring something new to the table. Uh, and so I want to do fresh interviews with people. I want to find out things that have never been known before. I mean, 
there were things in my Kurtzman book that Dennis Kitchen said, well, I learned a lot about Harvey Kurtzman I didn't know by reading your book. <laughs> and Dennis Kitchen was, uh, you know, um, Harvey Kurtzman's agent uh, in the latter part of his life. And so the idea uh, is that you need to get access to the material. So if you, if you the family will talk to you, if you can get... Um, family photographs, if you can get material that's never been seen before, then you really, I feel better about asking people to spend their money on the book uh, because they really aren't, they're, it's not, not, they're not just buying what was already known. And so when I select subjects, it has to be somebody who I can get the material from or if not from them directly, um, I can get it from lots of people that know them closely or you know, because I've written about people that have passed away, so obviously um, I can't, I couldn't interview Otto Binder because he he died, you know, 20 years before I wrote the book. But I could get access from, you know, they interviewed his friends and colleagues and so on, and that's um, that's part of the way reason why I, how I suge- uh, select projects is the access. But secondly, it has to be someone who interests me. Again, because it's, it takes so much work. Hmm. So I guess uh, maybe a logical follow-up question is, have you thought about whom your next biographical subject might be after Warren? <laughs> well, um, no, not. Uh, of course, I like to mix it up and not just do biographies. I like to do you know different sorts of books. I did the American Comic Book Chronicles uh, of the 50s, for tomorrow's, and I enjoyed doing that about the whole decade. Mm-hmm. Or founders of Comic Phantom, which is a selection of of short uh, biographical profiles of eighty to ninety people. Um, so I do mix it up, but um, I haven't decided who I'm going to do next. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to do another biography, uh, I, I uh, really don't know. So I'm open to suggestions. And by the way, if anybody needs or wants to get in touch with me. They can do so through my website, uh, which I may as well just say, because, I mean, uh, it's uh, my name all run together, Bill Shelley, one word, at, uh, or, excuse me, uh, dot N-E-T, Bill Shelley dot N-E-T, not C-O-M. And Bill Shelley Net uh, is a way that you can find out more about me. Um, and there's access to my email address. My public email address is on there, so you can contact me that way. And I'm also on Facebook. Mm. Yes, and I will include a link to your website in the show notes as well. Oh, that would be great. Yes. Because obviously I really need people to who are interested to buy my books because, you know, these aren't things that interest millions of people. Mm. But there are, they are books that when they are found by someone who's interested, they really enjoy them. I believe. And so, you know, uh, if, if you can point friends to the website, if you can tell friends about it, uh, boy, I really appreciate it. You know, I want to say a quick word about one of those titles that you mentioned a moment ago, and that is American Comic Book Chronicles, the 1950s. Um, I, I am a big fan of not, not only that text, which I absolutely love, but the series as a whole. I, I, you know, Tomorrow's does a lot of really good stuff. To me, one of their outstanding titles or series is this American Comic Books Chronicles. And I, I find them not only rich in terms of content or information, but also visually compelling as well. I mean, the design is just outstanding. In fact, I was talking with one of my co-hosts on an earlier episode of the podcast about the new volume, the 1990s, that will be coming out later this year. And You know, I mean, I come from an academic background, and right now we really don't have much of a shortage in terms of content-heavy analysis when it comes to comic studies and comics history. But at the same time, we really don't have much when it comes to wonderful, compelling design. And so these books by tomorrow, the American Comic Book Chronicles, I think, are just a wonderful melding of those two. And the 1950s volume, I think, is a great example of that. Well, I I agree that the, the books are visually so much fun to look at. They just uh, are just full of beautiful color, the color all the way through, first of all. 
They have um, lots of things that are rarities and things that are fascinating to look at that you may have never seen before. And they're well written, and they they cover the entire uh, period of time, whether it's the 50s, there's two of them for the 60s, the Mm -hmm. first half and the second half, and so on. But there really needed to be, uh, John Morrow felt, of tomorrow's, um, a, a reference encyclopedia for comics. And so these go year by year, and they have a, a timeline for every year, every year of the notable events and so on. So, you know, it's really a, a, a tremendous resource uh, of information, and they're very factually correct. Um, I know that I worked really hard on that in my 50s book, and I haven't had a lot of people coming back with me saying that they found issues. Um, and believe me, people like to point them out when they find them. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I had a lot of fun writing that book, although it drove me crazy because there's so much information to communicate. And, you know, but I wanted it to be readable so that you could read it almost like a story. And so I, that was my goal when I wrote my, the 50s book. Uh, the others are similar, but I don't know exactly what their individual writing goals were as, in, as people. But mine in the 50s was to write a book that you could sit down and read all the way through. Or, you know, you could... Um, take it to the bathroom with you, and it's great to just look through for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've read about all of them that are out now, and even though different volumes are by different authors or author teams, I can, I can say that there is a kind of tonal consistency in terms of, let's say, the as you mentioned, the narrative nature, right? Going from year to year within each volume, where you're telling – the author is – telling a story about comics during that decade or half decade, like the 1960s books. But I can't recommend them highly enough. Uh, they're really, really good texts. Yeah, I agree, and I'm, I'm part of it. <laughs> yes. But but I only wrote one, and yeah. there's I think there's, uh, I don't know how many there are now, but every decade, they're going to go back and do one on the 30s, I believe. Mm, right. But otherwise, um, I think they're, oh, and the, and the 40s books haven't come out yet either. Hmm. They're, they're imminent. Yeah, I think they're going to be two 40s books, right? Yes, there are. Yeah. Um, okay, coming back to your new book, Sense of Wonder, um, one of the things I'm curious about, and maybe in one form or another you've answered this question during our conversation today, is why come back to your life? I mean, what is going on right now with you at this point in your life that you wanted to revisit the original sense of wonder, add to it, revise it, and add a substantive second part to this? Well, uh, that's a good question, and, and really it comes from the fact that it's the first half is has a trajectory, and it takes me um, uh, as a kid from a kid to uh, being an, a young adult, and it you know it but the story leaves off before it's complete because my the whole story is about how um, I wanted to become a writer and an artist and express this creative impulse. So it's like, I felt like, well, gee, you know, it kind of leaves the reader hanging. And so the, by creating the second half, I mean, after all, I know what's happened in the rest of my life now, at least up until the point when I wrote this book. And I realized that there is a sort of a, 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 a balance, like there's a, like a bookend that would um, complete the story because I did become the writer that I dreamed about. Um, and uh, I had a perfect way of capping it because uh, my Harvey Kurtzman book did win the Eisner Award for Best Comics Related Book. So it's you know that was a nice uh, cherry at the, uh, on top to end the book with. Um, and um, also, um, you know, I had a relationship briefly with I fell in love when I was young, and I, I got back together with my uh, uh, childhood love, so to speak, uh, late in life. And there's so there's kind of a symmetry and a completeness that appealed to me because, you know, I am kind of obsessive about that kind of thing. <laughs> and also, it just felt to me like telling the whole story would show that, you know, despite all obstacles, all kinds of things that got in the way, whether it was being gay, whether it was because someone wouldn't publish me, and so on, all getting past all these obstacles 
you know, I was able to do that by just being persistent, by being lucky, and by really having this desire that would not quit uh, to write. And therefore, I felt like it could almost uh, inspire other people. It could show that even in later in life that you can do that, even if you didn't make it as a young person. Um, and so I felt like it had value for that reason. And then, of course, um, in general, I wanted to talk about um, my son, Jameson, who um, I wanted to include in the book because, unfortunately, very sadly, he uh, passed away when he was 20 of testicular cancer. And I felt like I wanted to do a tribute to him. And this book was a way of telling his story. Uh, so that was another motive. Um, and, you know, so the, there's the whole human experience in there. Mm. All really fascinating reasons uh, to come back to your life story. And I'm glad that you did pick up uh, from where you left off and then some from your 2001 <laughs> book that came originally from uh, Tomorrow's Publishing. Bill, I want to thank you again for coming on the Comics Alternative and talking with us, and I'm sure we'll have you on again, as prolific as you are. Uh, your new book, Sense of Wonder, My Life in Comics Fandom, the whole story came out last month from North Atlantic Books, and our listeners should definitely go out and get a copy. Well, thanks for having me on. I'll come back anytime. I want to thank Bill Shelley again for coming back on the Comics Alternative to discuss his work. His latest book, Sense of Wonder, My Life in Comic Fandom, The Whole Story, is out now, and if you're a student of comics history, this is definitely a must-read. And you can learn more about Bill and his work by checking out his website, BillShelley.net. And after visiting his website, check out the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service, Go to DCBService.com, where every month you'll find unbeatable prices on your favorite titles, including many of Bill Shelley's books. That's DCBService.com. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with me and let me know what you thought about my interview with Bill Shelley. If you go to our website, ComicsAlternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up your phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can find us all over social media. We have accounts on Twitter. Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com We've got many more podcast episodes lined up for the days to come, so be sure to check back for those. Until then, enjoy your day.